Council. It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is the Premier. On Tuesday, the courts recognized that Bill 124 was unconstitutional. The decision reads that the government has not, and I quote, explained why it was necessary to infringe on constitutional rights to impose wage constraints at the same time as it was providing tax cuts or license plate sticker refunds that were more than 10 times larger than the savings obtained from wage restraint measures. If the economic condition, conditions didn't justify infringing on constitutionally protected rights, then why did the Premier introduce Bill 124 in the first place? The President of the Treasury Board to respond on behalf of the government. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. As the member opposite knows, uh, we are reviewing the decision and our intention is to appeal. But let's speak to the investments, historic investments that this government has made uh, sure. across this province, over $170 billion invested. Wow. Let's look at uh, health care investments. We've got a $40 billion uh, infrastructure, hospital infrastructure plan that we're going to put forward. That's going to build new hospitals all across the province. New hospitals in a city like Brampton that was neglected, ignored by the previous Liberal government. A new hospital in the city of Windsor. A new hospital in Uxbridge. A new hospital in Mississauga. Mr. Speaker, we are making the critical investments needed to support this province throughout uh, the, the last four years, and we'll continue to deliver on that uh, over the next four. Response? <laughs> Supplementary question. Uh, I think it's been reinforced that there isn't a critical lack of money that, in fact, the funds were there to pay people decently. Bill 124 has driven nurses out of our hospitals and created a staffing crisis in our health care system. The government can start undoing the mess that they made. So will the Premier drop his intention to appeal the court's ruling on Bill 124 and finally work on a plan to recruit, train, retain, and return nurses to our health care system? Again, the President of the Treasury Board. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to speak to the investments that we have made in health human resources uh, across uh, this province, especially in the last uh, uh, four years. The largest health care investment increase year over year was recorded last year when this government put an additional $5.2 billion into the health care system. What does that mean, Mr. Speaker? Since March of 2020, we have added over 12,000 healthcare professionals into the system. Just this year, the uh, Ontario uh, College of Nurses has registered 12,800 nurses, and we still have a month to go. So we will continue to make these historic and unprecedented investments uh, that we have been making to ensure we have the health human resources across this province. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And with this question to the Minister of Labour, Yesterday, the Minister of Labour stood in this House and, instead of addressing the substance of the opposition's legitimate questions into Bill 124, he opted for talking points about private sector unions, even though he knows full well that there isn't a union, public or private, in this province that supported Bill 124. So, with the benefit of hindsight, will the minister tell the hundreds of thousands of broader public sector workers in this province why it was he backed a bill that suspended their rights to collectively bargain in the first place? And the President of the Treasury Board. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'll repeat for the member opposite. As we review the decision, our intention um, is to appeal, and we are incredibly grateful to our public service across this province uh, that uh, serve uh, Ontario and Ontarians. And Order. we're also, also incredibly proud of the Order. investments that we are making uh, in this uh, province. Just uh, three months ago, uh, the Minister of Finance uh, tabled our budget, uh, which, in fact, the members opposite voted against, oh. voted against uh, increasing health care funding to this province, uh, voted against uh, building infrastructure, a $160 billion Shame. infrastructure plan Shame. across this province, which would see Order. hospitals in uh, places like cities like Windsor and cities like uh, Brampton and Scarborough all across this province. So we will continue Response. to make these historic and unprecedented investments across this province. <laughs> Member for Brampton North, the member for Waterloo will come to order. Next question, the member for Humber River Black Creek. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. 
Speaker, the Auditor General tabled a report yesterday and painted a very clear picture of the state of auto insurance here in Ontario. So my question is very simple. Does the Premier agree that Ontario drivers are being gouged on their auto insurance? Yes or no? And to reply, Minister Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you to the member opposite for uh, that important question. Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, could have saved the Auditor General some time and money. Maybe uh, we should have done a value for money on this finding because, of course, as the member opposite knows, that we take the cost of auto insurance very seriously. Mr. Speaker, as the member opposite knows, through the pandemic, we saw a rate relief of $1.3 billion for auto insurance drivers in this province, Mr. Speaker. Now, the member opposite knows that as well, but the member opposite, because I know he's a very learned fellow, has read page 102 of the budget that was tabled in April, which the uh, member for Brampton South just highlighted that your party didn't vote for. And, Mr. Speaker, I'll highlight what's on page 102 in the supplemental question. Supplementary. Speaker, it's only 10.30 a.m., and it seems the minister is already out to lunch on this issue. So I'm, I'm going to help him. I'm going to help him. The answer is, the answer is, yes, Ontario drivers are being gouged on their auto insurance. Yes, we pay the highest auto insurance rates in Canada despite having some of the lowest per capita accidents. In fact, accidents have been down since the start of the pandemic, and yet insurance rates are climbing at double the rate of inflation. And while Ontarians are struggling, insurer profits hit 27 percent and drivers are overpaying in the hundreds of millions. So will this government do the right thing and bring auto insurance premiums down to the level they should be? Yes or no? Yeah. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, maybe I'll take the member opposite out for lunch. <laughs> so uh, I do appreciate the question. It's a very serious question, Mr. Speaker. So, let me read from page 103, sorry, from the budget, which I'm sure the, the learned member read. Uh, the Financial Services Regulatory Authority of Ontario is implementing a new strategy for reforming the regulation of automobile insurance rates and underwriting. As part of the new strategy, FISRA will be developing a new framework for ensuring fairness in rates that would replace outdated guidance, including existing guidance on territorial rating, also known as postal codes, right here on page 103. So I'd ask the member opposite, do you support that in the budget, and why did you vote no? Members to make their comments through the chair. Order. Final Speaker. Please start the clock. Final supplementary. Uh, I thought the minister was supposed to give answers, not ask questions. And you know what? This, this is exactly why this minister is one of my top 10 favorite fantasy authors of all time. <laughs> Speaker, the proof is in the premiums. I've said it before. The Auditor General has confirmed what New Democrats have been saying here for years. Auto insurance, postal code discrimination is real and it has to stop. Drivers with clean driving records in Brampton, Scarborough, Northwest Toronto, and many other GTA neighbourhoods are paying double the rates of others. And two months ago, I tabled a bill to end auto insurance postal code discrimination in the GTA. The government supported this very same bill before the election. The Premier said it was a priority. So will they pass Question. this bill into law immediately? Yes or no? Yeah. Mr. Well, Mr. Speaker, I know the member opposite would love to be on this side of the House uh, so that uh, we he, can make he could help us reduce insurance rates. I'll come back to the pandemic. Some $1.3 billion of relief, zero increases for two years, because we've been focused on keeping costs down for the people of Ontario. 
But, Mr. Speaker, it just doesn't end uh, with uh, territorial ratings that we're looking to provide value for auto insurance uh, uh, premium premiums and uh, the people of Ontario. We're also looking at choice. That's also on page 103. We're looking at more choice for auto drivers uh, you know, who uh, want more choice in the industry. We're also looking at fraud and abuse, Mr. Speaker. We've directed FISRA to look, collect the data so that we can tackle fraud and abuse in the system. Response. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite knows well that this government's priority is to provide relief to the hardworking people of Ontario, and that's what we ran on, and that's what we'll get. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Ottawa West McKeon. Thank you, Speaker. Yesterday's Ottawa LRT inquiry report revealed a cascade of problems due to the decision to build the LRT as a public-private partnership. The report said, quote, in many ways, the P3 model caused or contributed to several of the ongoing difficulties in the project. These difficulties included a lack of transparency, misleading information from the P3 contractor, and the city's inability to hold the P3 partner accountable for deficiencies. Will the government learn the lessons of the Ottawa LRT fiasco and stop signing risky P3 contracts? To reply, Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much uh, to the member for the question, and certainly we're grateful to the Commission. But, Mr. Speaker, it's because of the P3 projects that we have that we are able to build subways in the City of here, Toronto here, here. and in York Region. It's, it's the reason why we're building highways like Highway 3, Highway 427 extension, Highway 401 widen, widening, and the Garden City Skyway. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's the reason why we've made such great progress on building hospitals in the province of Ontario, like Niagara, Vaughan, Cordellucci, West, West Lincoln Memorial Hospital, Niagara South, Trillium, Ottawa. Mr. Speaker, I've always said I've been very transparent. We will use the right model for the right project, and we will proceed in that way. Very Thank good. Member for Parkdale High Park, supplementary. Yeah. The same P3 contractors and private consultants responsible for the Ottawa LRT are also responsible for the Eglinton Crosstown P3. The Auditor General warned of deficient designs and missed deadlines. There are already signs that the problems experienced with the Ottawa LRT could happen with the Eglinton Crosstown P3. Metrolinx keeps announcing more delays and keeps paying more money to the P3 contractor. They recently announced yet another one-year delay, which both the Minister and Metrolinx have refused to explain. Clearly, something has once again gone wrong with the Eglinton Crosstown P3. What is the Ministry and the Metrolinx hiding? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Transportation has been very clear that she is doing everything she absolutely can to make sure that we can get the Eglinton Crosstown running as quickly as possible. But, Mr. Speaker, our P3 history in the province of Ontario is a wonderful one. We have brought to life 74 projects since the inception of Infrastructure Ontario. Since our government was elected, we brought 24 projects to market, 15 of which are currently in construction. Mr. Speaker, we were elected on a strong mandate to build this province, mm -hmm. and that's what we will do. Sure. Next question, member for Whitby. Speaker, my uh, question is to the Minister of Infrastructure. In the coming decades, Ontario's population is expected to grow by more than 6 million people. As our population grows, investing in infrastructure is now more important than ever, Speaker. Clogged roads and gridlocked highways hurt our hardworking families as they're stuck in traffic longer than needed. Outdated and antiquated infrastructure drags down our economy, makes us less competitive as a province. Speaker, Ontario cannot afford to hold this economy back. Now is the time to build. Speaker, can the Minister of Infrastructure please share with the House what our government is doing to build effective and resilient infrastructure for all Ontarians? Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much to the member. And again, Mr. Speaker, we were elected on a very strong mandate to invest in infrastructure, which is why we are investing $159 billion over the next 10 years. Last week, we announced our updated P3 uh, project pipeline, which included 39 projects. And Mr. Speaker, during COVID-19, under the 
Premier Ford's leadership, we developed the Rapid Build uh, program to build long-term care homes as quickly as possible, which resulted in 320 additional beds at Lake Ridge and a construction period of 13 months. Mr. Speaker, we are taking those learnings through the Rapid Delivery program, and we've announced our first Rapid Delivery program to build schools in the province of Ontario. This includes five new schools, creating 15,700 student spaces and 1,500 child care spaces. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and back to the Minister. Speaker, addressing our infrastructure needs today is an investment in the future of our province. Together, let's build health care networks that better serve our patients and keep our province moving ahead. Infrastructure investments ensure a stronger economy, better jobs, and bigger paychecks for all Ontarians. Communities like Brampton, Windsor, and my region of Durham are all places that have long advocated, long advocated, Speaker, for infrastructure investments. But sadly, Speaker, the previous Liberal government ignored our needs. Now is the time for our government to act. Now is the time, Speaker, to get shovels in the ground. Speaker, can the Minister Question. of Infrastructure tell the House what critical projects our government is undertaking as we, together, rebuild Ontario? Minister of Infrastructure. I certainly can, Mr. Speaker. The people elected us. They brought us back here because they want more hospitals, they want more highways, they want more schools and more public transit. In our most recent P3 pipeline update, we are advancing procurement and construction on our hospitals and children's treatment centers. Uh, ones like Niagara Health, Trillium Queensway, Mississauga, Waha, CAMH, CHEO, and Quinty Health. With regards to transportation, we continue to advance Highway 3, Scarborough Subway, the Eglinton Crosstown West Extension, Ontario Line North, which we've broken up into two separate contracts, and the Garden City Skyway. Not only that, Mr. Speaker, we're also bringing Ontario Place back to life so yes. that families have a wonderful place on the waterfront to enjoy with their families. Beautiful. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, yesterday's Auditor General report showed that the Ontario Lottery and Gaming uh, signed private casino contracts based on unrealistic bids. But instead of holding those contractors to their contracts, agreed to let them pay $3.3 billion less to the government. Ooh. Speaker, these are billions of dollars that should have gone to supporting our schools, our hospitals. To the Premier, why is this government letting the OLG undermine its own credibility by signing and renegotiating bad contracts? Mr. Finance. Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you to the member opposite for that question. You know, Mr. Speaker, uh, those contracts, which were uh, signed in uh, about the about a decade ago, 2012. Now, between 2011 and 2014, I think there was a minority government, and who supported the, uh, the minority oh. levels? Uh, oh, the member opposite's uh, party. Uh, look, over the last decade, the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation has been good for taxpayers. In fact, the most recent year returned $1.5 billion to the taxpayers of this great province, Mr. Speaker. Not only that, provided significant growth to the economy through good jobs, good working jobs, good paying jobs, bigger paychecks, Mr. Speaker. Response. And finally, the citizens of this province, we have a great entertainment industry through the Ontario Lottery Gaming uh, Corporation that provides entertainment value to the citizens at all the casinos and all the great. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Speaker. I mean, if I could enforce those contracts, I would. But you know who could? This Minister of Finance. He could do that. The auditor has also showed that the OLG and its private casino operators do not have adequate processes to prevent money laundering. Uh, quote, uh, at two casinos, mystery shoppers were able to obtain four casino checks for between $4,900 and $10,000 with limited pay Order. and no casino winnings, despite 
OLG's money laundering policy that play must be verified before issuing any checks above $3,000. Mr. Speaker, money laundering is happening in Ontario's casinos. Uh, British Columbia has stronger money Order. laundering provisions in place today but that, that the government should bring in. And so my question is really simple. Will the Minister of Finance commit what? to making those changes today so that money laundering does not happen in Ontario casinos? Mr. Speaker, there's no room for bad actors in this province. But let me tell you, the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation has a very rigorous process. It has policies and procedures in place, and Mr. Speaker, uh, they've increased their enforcement uh, over the years and, and are doing a terrific job. We will always go after bad actors, Mr. Speaker. But let me tell you this: I, I, I have to question uh, the scope and the misincreep of the Auditor General to using taxpayer do dollars to do a sting operation in an area that we have plenty. Plenty of enforcement in this Order. province. We are going to go after the bad actors, Order. Mr. Speaker. We are going to make sure that we have the highest standards in this province. We take it seriously. The OLG takes it seriously, and this government takes it seriously. Next question, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of, uh, of Energy, Speaker. Oh, great Concerns about the issues of access to electricity in our province exist. Communities in rural, remote, and northern Ontario deserve access to a reliable source of electricity. But sadly, for many, that's just not the case. In many Indigenous and northern communities, the continued reliance on diesel generators is an ongoing challenge that's right. that needs to be addressed. Diesel-generated electricity is expensive, it's polluting, and it doesn't meet the needs of any growing communities. Indigenous communities across Ontario serve as important partners in our energy sector. Speaker, can the Minister of Energy please elaborate on what our government is doing to ensure northern, remote, and Indigenous communities Question. have access to the electricity they need? Thank you. <laughs> Minister of Energy. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Thanks to the member opposite for the question. As Minister of Energy, my top priority is to ensure that we have a reliable, clean electricity grid that meets the needs of everyone across Ontario, especially in remote communities. The member is right that there are still some remote fly-in communities that are operating on diesel generators, Mr. Speaker. That's expensive. It's not good for the environment, and it doesn't allow for growth and new homes and expansion to be built in these communities. That's why it was really important last week that I joined my friend and colleague, uh, MPP from Kuetnong in Kingfisher Lake, his home community, Mr. Speaker, with many of his family members. It was a tremendous day as we lit up that community to the provincial grid, Mr. Speaker, thanks to the Wate Nakiniap Power Project, which is a tremendous project. It's known as the line that brings light, Mr. Speaker. I would add it's the line that brings hope as well. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you to the minister for that response. It's encouraging to see our government's leadership working alongside First Nation communities to partner on connecting our electricity grid to Northern Ontario. Being connected to our electricity grid unlocks future economic and social development in Northern communities, including new schools, housing, and economic opportunity. Speaker, can the Minister of Energy elaborate on the Wate Power Project? And please tell this House how this First Nation-led project will bring energy certainty and new opportunities to northwestern Ontario. Thanks for your support. <laughs> Mr. Energy. Thanks very much. Uh, the Watina Kiniap Power Project is a very important project. 1,800 kilometres of transmission line, an Indigenous-led project, 24 First Nations teaming with Fortis Power, Mr. Speaker, to, to connect communities like Kingfisher Lake and 16 others uh, to the provincial grid, Mr. Speaker. Our government's proud to support this project with $1.34 billion, uh, which will help the construction during this time. Three of the 17 fly-in communities have already been connected to the provincial grid. Uh, Chief Eddie Mamakwa in Kingfisher Lake said last week, you know, he recalls, and, and the member opposite said this to me as well, he recalls when the first diesel generators were brought in in 82, the runway was built in 87, the running water came in in 93, and uh, they'll always remember in 2022 when they hooked up to the provincial grid. It allows for growth. It allows for housing to be built in the community. It allows for the new school 
that's being built in Kingfisher Lake to be powered. This is what Spons? can happen when we work together with First Nations partners to ensure that we're seeing economic prosperity in their communities. It's a tremendous partnership and should be congratulated. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Yesterday's Auditor General report revealed the government is failing to make adequate use of its renewable energy resources. Another report yesterday showed that this government is about to waste the money of Ontario ratepayers by procuring more gas plants. The report by Power Advisory says it would be cheaper to invest in efficiency, conservation, renewable energy and storage instead of spending billions on new gas plants. Hydro bills are already too high. Why is the Premier wasting money on new gas plants when there are cheaper options that don't use fossil fuel? Mr. Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, thanks to the member opposite, it's pretty rich coming from the member opposite to talk about affordability in the energy sector. When his own party believes that we should get rid of natural gas, a baseload power supply, and that member in particular is not supportive of nuclear, which provides 60 per cent of our baseload power in the province every day. Each and every day my job as the Ministry of Energy is to ensure that we have an affordable and reliable supply of electricity in the province, Mr. Speaker. The independent electricity system operator has advised us that if we were to remove natural gas from the system, we would have blackouts and brownouts. Is that what this member wants? It's certainly not what this government wants or what the people of Ontario need, Mr. Speaker. We're seeing record investments in our province because we now have a reliable and affordable electricity grid in the province of Ontario, one that is competitive with other jurisdictions, and we're seeing the results with multi-billion dollar investments here in Ontario. Supplementary. Well, an interesting dodge, so let's try it again. The Premier has promised private gas plant companies that Ontario ratepayers will keep paying for the new gas plants even after they are shut down. The gas plant contracts will run to 2040, but those plants will be shut down long before under federal law. We already had one gas plant scandal under the Liberals, and it looks like the PC government is determined to do exactly the same thing. How much will Ontario ratepayers be forced to pay for new gas plant contracts after these plants have been shut down? Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite wants to shut down gas plants now, Mr. Speaker. That would result in brownouts in our province. Completely unacceptable. The independent electricity system operator has also told us that it would increase electricity bills by $100 a month. That is unacceptable to our government, Mr. Speaker, and it's unacceptable to the people of the province of Ontario. This member, and we saw a glimpse of their energy policy a couple of weeks ago when the member from Ottawa Centre ran extension cords across the bridge from Ottawa to Gatineau. That's a look at what we could expect, God forbid, if an NDP government was ever in charge of our energy supply, Mr. Speaker. We simply can't have that unpredictability. We have to have a reliable and affordable system in every single day. I'm working to ensure that our system is clean, Response. safe, offers choice, it's reliable and affordable so we can see the growth that we need in our province. Thank you. The next question, member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much. My question is for the Premier. In 2018, the Premier was caught on video telling a room full of developers, we will open up the Greenbelt, a big chunk of it. Then in May of that year, he swore to all Ontarians that he unequivocally wouldn't touch the Greenbelt. And in April 2021, he said, we're not going to touch the Greenbelt. So here we are, December 2022. It's Christmas. And the Premier is proud to say, promise made, promise kept to his rich developer friends. The problem is he broke his promise to the people of Ontario. He's giving away the people's green belt, Order. huge chunks of it. It's not his to give. So, Speaker, through you to the Premier, can the Premier stand here today and tell us why anyone would believe anything that he says? Mr. Municipal Ferries and House. I could say the same thing about the honourable member. He stood here in this house and, as a member of the governing Liberal Party, carved up the green belt 17 times. No apologies. No answers. 
answers for the people of the town. We made it very for a we driving open. range. We were clear. We were transparent. We're in the middle of a housing crisis, Speaker, and we posted on the environmental registry a plan that would provide a minimum of 50,000 homes. Many of these sites uh, have uh, received uh, municipal support. The one in Pickering, uh, Mayor Ash. I have a letter that I'll read in the supplemental, clearly indicating uh, that they wanted this property in the draft. Uh, to be available for home construction. All of these sites are adjacent to existing urban areas. They're all able to be serviced. And at the end of the day, our plan, unlike the Liberals, added, will, will add to over 2,000 acres uh, to the Greenbelt. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, it's evident that the Premier thinks part of his job description is to make his very rich friends even richer. It's clear that there's a pattern of people gaining inside knowledge and advance notice of this government's decisions. Order, order. The member for Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke will come to order. And I heard what the member for Ottawa South said. And I, I will remind all members that, that you can't impute motive in the House. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw and then conclude his question. Speaker. Why would someone take out a hundred million dollars? Okay. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. Okay. Sorry, I didn't hear you, Speaker. There is a clear pattern of people gaining inside knowledge. Order. Why would someone take out a hundred million dollar loan at 21 percent interest to buy land that you could literally do nothing on? And weeks later, Magically, you could. It took more than a day for this government to say no when they were asked whether developers got a heads up. A whole day. It's not the developer's green belt. It's not the government's green belt. It's not the premier's green belt to give away. It's the people's green belt. So, Speaker, through you, will the premier stand in this house and tell the people of Ontario that his rich developer friends did not get a heads up? Minister of Affairs and Housing. You know, it's, it's pretty rich, uh, you know, coming from uh, a gentleman who worked for uh, Premier McGuinty, who stood in this house, who sat in this chamber on this side of the house, and and carved up the green belt 17 times. It's pretty pretty rich that this guy is uh, bringing this question forward. I'm going to read you a letter from the Mayor of Pickering, uh, His Worship Mayor Kevin Ash. Uh, the first paragraph says it all. You recently received a letter from Mayor Ryan requesting the repeal of the Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve Act 2005 in the City of Pickering. As the newly elected mayor of the city, I would like to support this request. As noted by Mayor Ryan, these lands were part of the regional and municipal growth plans for settlement area expansion to the Greenbelt 20 years ago. We're moving forward on this request from municipalities, other requests from municipalities. At the end of the day, uh, the plan proposed will have a minimum of 50,000 homes uh, you know, provided for us and over 10,000 homes. Thank you. Thank you. And before Ottawa South will come to order, the Minister of Northern Development will come to order. The next question, member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, studies reveal that approximately one in five children in Ontario are encountering mental health challenges. The past few years have been especially difficult for our youth as they face unique challenges augmented by the isolation brought on by the pandemic. It is therefore crucial for our government to expand access to innovative solutions in order to support the mental health and well-being of Ontario's children and youth. Speaker, can the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions please share with this House how our government is ensuring high-quality care for children and young people through integrated services such as the Youth Wellness Hub? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Mississauga Centre for her question. Since 2019, we've invested $570 million into child and youth mental health supports across the province of Ontario, and in June of 2021, we dedicated another $31 million to reducing wait times and improving access to mental health services. Expanded alongside these services are our youth wellness hubs. These are one-stop shops for mental health and addictions treatment, primary care services, and early intervention programming for youth aged 12 to 25. 
available on a walk-in basis, they offer a safe space for youth, a warm handoff to other community-based care providers, ensuring children that are in need of help that there is no wrong door. We now have 22 of them in the province of Ontario. We've green greenlit Spons? another eight. And I'm looking forward uh, in my supplemental to talking a little bit about the work of Joanna Henderson at KMH and the great work when we collaborate that we can do as a province and state. Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And I thank the minister for his response and for his tireless work on mental health and addictions for our province. In I am proud that one of the 22 youth wellness hubs that the minister spoke of is actually located in Malton, in my city of Mississauga. The Malton Youth Wellness Hub provides vital services to youth in my riding, such as mental health counseling, substance use support, employment, housing and education support, as well as recreation. These services are being delivered through partnerships with organizations like the Catholic Family Services Peel Dufferin, CMHA Peel Dufferin and Our Place Peel, and many, many others. In 2010, the previous Liberal government was provided a report prepared by an all-party committee, which included 23 recommendations to improve mental health services. Speaker, not a single one of those recommendations was implemented. Unlike the Liberals, our government is committed to working with Question. our mental health partners to support and address our children and youth mental health and well-being needs. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please elaborate on how our government is building a comprehensive plan uh, to connect mental health and addiction system? The Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again for that question. This Monday, Dr. Henderson and uh, myself got together to announce an exciting pan-Canadian initiative called the Integrated Youth Services Net, the IYS Net. And as many of you here today have heard me say over and over again, if we can't measure it, we can't manage it. The IYS Net will connect every youth hub across Canada through a shared data infrastructure, easing collaboration between researchers and policymakers. Imagine that, Mr. Speaker. Mental health practice informed by real-time data exchanges and that optimize service delivery and treatment outcomes, learning from youth and proactively adapting to their needs. This is an unprecedented opportunity for us to be creative, collaborative, and make catalytic change. Mr. Speaker, together with our provincial, provincial and territorial allies, we're building a system centered around the values of justice, diversity, inclusion, Honest. and the lived experiences of our young people all across Ontario. Mr. Speaker, this is what we're focused on, and we, we will build that system in collaboration with all our partners. Thank you. Next question, the member for Niagara Center. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, I've asked the Minister numerous times whether the government had tipped off developers about plans to open the Greenbelt for development. The Minister has had multiple different answers to our questions. First, the answer was that the government talks to anyone who builds homes. Yesterday, the Minister said no, without any further elaboration. Every day, it seems we get a new answer from the Minister. So today, I'll ask again. Speaker, did the minister or any other government or PC party official share with any landowner, developer or lobbyist information about the government's plan for developing the Greenbelt before it became public on November 4th? Mr. 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 Uh, speaker, I answered yesterday that no, I did not, and that I will assist the integrity commissioner in the investigation. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Up until April, the Chief of Staff to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing was Luca Bucci. In June, Mr. Bucci was hired as the CEO of the Ontario Home Builders Association. Despite a one-year cooling-off period required of former government officials who become lobbyists, Mr. Bucci seems to be lobbying the government on development issues and recently spoke at the Heritage Committee in support of Bill 23, where he interacted with the Minister's parliamentary assistant. He appeared this morning to speak in, behavior, in favor of Bill 39. The cooling off period exists to prevent lobbyists from putting their former employers in a real or potential conflict of interest. Why is the minister allowing his office to be lobbied by his former chief of staff? The government has made a reply. Such disappointment, colleagues, from, uh, from across that I got up. I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat hurt by that. But here's the reality. Here's the reality, Speaker. They can couch it any 
way they like, because they have been doing it for not only just the last two weeks, really. They've been doing it for the entire time that the NDP has existed, and that is the Committee of No. Right? They don't want people to have homes. They don't want people to have homes in the GTA. They're happy that where we're at. But we said no right from the beginning, right, colleagues? We were elected on a mission to make Ontario better than it was than we, when we took over, Mr. Speaker. So what have we done? We've done better on health care. We've done better on education. We're doing better to put more money in the pockets of the people of the province of Ontario. Well, they want, they want people to live in their parents' basements forever. I know a lot of parents here who want their kids Order. out of the basement and into a brand Order. new home somewhere in the province of Ontario. That's what I know that uh, is a dream of everybody. I know that when my parents came to this country, you know what my parents did? They wanted to have a better, a better tomorrow for their kids, and that is what we're all about. So you can continue to say no, hold people down, we'll move forward, give hope and prosperity for everybody. And the next question, member for Kitchener South Hester. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Uh, I, uh, I unabashedly identify as a pet parent. Unfortunately, uh, I've spent far more time in veterinary clinics than any pet parent would want to. We have a significant shortage of veterinarians um, in my area, in Ontario, and across the province. And I know from firsthand experience from, from those of my friends that it's causing um, significant wait times, problems with emergency uh, clinics, and, uh, and burnout in our veterinarians. It's also having an impact on our farmers who can't find people to take care of their livestock. Uh, speaker, I would ask if our uh, Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs could please highlight what our government is doing in order to address this issue. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, and I very much appreciate your, your devotion and the question as well, because this is something that people across Ontario are talking about, just not pet owners, but Ontario livestock farmers as well. And I want to be perfectly clear that this is an issue in terms of access to veterinarian services. It's an issue that's across the nation. But here in Ontario, we're taking action. You know, this past spring, we met with stakeholders from the veterinarian sector, and they identified very clearly that we needed to modernize. And the fact of the matter is, the Veterinary Act in Ontario hasn't been looked at for over 30 years. But, Speaker, it's our government that is taking action, and for the first time, we are looking and working with our stakeholders to identify how we need to modernize. Given the fact that there's new technologies and, uh, and the scope of practice for both veterinarians Response. and vet technicians have evolved, we need to get with the times and modernize our legislation in this province as well. And so it's part of our Grow Ontario strategy that we're going to be moving forward with, and I'll speak more about it in my supplement. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, it's, uh, it's without any uh, hyperbole whatsoever when I say I'm incredibly excited uh, about this. Um, again, from, from my experience, I've spent a lot of time with a lot of our um, registered veterinary technicians across this province, and I know, again, from experience I wish I hadn't had, but from experience just how valuable they are and uh, how extensive their learning and experience is and what they could do to help veterinary services. Uh, I'd ask if the minister could talk a, a little bit more about how modernizing the Veterinarians Act could allow our amazing uh, registered veterinary technicians technicians to provide more services and, and, and help sort of fulfill this gap. Mr. Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much. And to the member from Kitchener South Hessler, you know, we, we are going to be listening first and foremost, and we certainly look forward to your input as well as input from people involved in the sector from across Ontario. And the member from Elgin Middlesex, London, will be leading these consultations across this province as he goes on tour because we want to hear first and foremost, you know, how has the sector evolved? How do we need to modernize? How do we need to develop legislation in 2022 that creates less red tape and builds a stronger Ontario? Because, Speaker, that's what Bill 46 is all about. And as we look to to grow Ontario, we want to make sure that people have their voices heard, and we're looking very much forward to an expansive consultation process that will identify the new scopes of practices that have evolved Response. for context, as well as our veterinarians. And first and foremost, the important aspect here is that we are engaging everyone in the veterinarian sector to make sure we get it right. Thank you very much. Member for Thunder Bay, Superior North. Thank you. My question is to the Premier. 
Frontline mental health and addictions workers have been clear we are in acute crisis with record numbers of opioid deaths in Ontario. This crisis is particularly acute in Thunder Bay, where we have four times the provincial average of deaths. Will the province increase community-based addiction services, including harm reduction and supportive housing, and increase capacity in publicly funded, publicly run treatment centres in our communities? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Karen, thank you to the member opposite for the question. We know that there is an opioid crisis in the province of Ontario that predated the pandemic, and it only was aggravated with the pandemic. Our government, the first government, has made historical investments in addiction treatment and mental wellness, and those investments now total $525 million in annualized investments. In addition to those investments, because of the pandemic, we created a, an addiction recovery fund another $90 million that created 400 treatment beds, 7,000 new treatment spots that are out and about all over the province of Ontario. Now, those investments are being made where they're needed most, and the focus was on jurisdictions, on cities and towns where those were needed the most, where we had the highest rates of overdoses. And so investments were made in Sioux Lookout, 40 beds, in Thunder Bay, 35, in uh, uh, Sudbury, 15, in Timmins, 10, and 54 in Canador, at Canador College in North Bay. Now, why were those investments made? Because we are going to build a continuum of care. Response. We're going to look after individuals from the time that they require withdrawal management, through addiction, through supports, all the way to providing them with supportive housing, because that's what we need to do. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Uh, thank you for mentioning supportive housing. I appreciate that and look forward to seeing more of that in our region. In Thunder Bay, there are a multitude of for-profit methadone clinics in the business of keeping people hooked on methadone. Hmm. As a profit medical practice, it is in their financial interest to keep people on methadone indefinitely. In contrast, not-for-profit clinics work with clients to gradually reduce re dosages until the person is drug-free. Will the government investigate these exploitative businesses and commit to supporting community-based, not-for-profit mental health and addictions treatment that includes mobile crisis response teams and the building of supportive housing, which I'm glad we are, you intend to do? The Social Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that great question. I mean, when you stop and think about the amount of supports and services that we need in the province of Ontario, we all know, or we should know, that that treatment should be in the communities. It should be delivered in a way that is measured so that we know that the outcomes that we're getting are the ones that are the best for the people in the province of Ontario. And we also know that we need to do more to ensure we have low barrier access points to be able to get into a system to get the supports that are necessary. So when you talk about mobile crisis intervention teams, I support them. We support them as a government. We have expanded them throughout the province and will continue to do so because we know that it's a way to get individuals the help that they need. And that's the key point here. We have to get people to treatment, which is why those 400 Spons. beds were created, why we have 7,000 additional treatment spots. And yes, we will deliver services at the same standard and level across the province of Ontario, because that's what every Ontarian deserves to have in their community. Thank you. The member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. <clears throat> Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. As our lives become increasingly dependent on digital technology, we need to be more knowledgeable about the ever-present cyber threats we now face. Recently, we saw the negative impacts that cybersecurity attacks can have, with the school board reporting that it was affected by a cyber incident. As a province, we must ensure that we are equipped with the necessary tools to stay safe as we access services digitally. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to prioritize the safety and the security of all the people of Ontario in our increasingly digital world. Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I thank the great member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry for the great work he's doing for the people uh, of his riding. 
Speaker, since our government introduced Ontario's first ever cybersecurity strategy in 2019, we have rolled up our sleeves and gotten to work. As you know, Speaker, many of us uh, know this very well, that a key pillar of this strategy was the creation of our cyber security expert panel appointed to help evaluate the state of cyber security across the OPS and BPS. And after two years of hard work and collaboration, our government has publicly released their final report earlier this October and committed to implementing its recommendation. Speaker, this report is a major Bots. milestone on our path to improving our cyber resilience, and perhaps most importantly, it helps us create even more secure online services for Ontarians. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. Cyber attacks have become more sophisticated and frequent, targeting vital services. As our government continues our ambitious agenda to utilize digital capabilities for programs and services, we are responsible for protecting the public from harmful cyber security threats. The public expects the data they share with their government to be secure and safely managed. Speaker, could the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery please elaborate on the next steps our government is taking to better protect cybersecurity for all the people of Ontario? Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and I again thank the member for his question. Speaker, the work ahead to implement these recommendations will not always be easy, and it will certainly not be immediate. But I can pledge to you today that I will work tirelessly with my colleagues to usher in the changes needed to bolster our cyber security across all of government. Yeah. The expert panel recommendations are forming the foundation of our cybersecurity policies and help develop the best practices that we will share across all sectors. Our ongoing digital transformation has already delivered significant benefits to the public and businesses, and we must continue to protect them from cyber threats so we can deliver on our Response. government's plan to make life easier and build a stronger Ontario. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last week, the Minister of Health said that the primary care physicians should treat more children so they do not have to go to emergency rooms. However, the reality, Speaker, is that 1.8 million Ontarians don't have a regular family physicians to even go in these situations. OHIP covered virtual care has been one of the last resorts that, pa that parents and their sick children have had to find immediate medical help, which this government is gutting, leaving parents with a cost of about $29 a month. Our government is allowing for private ventures like Kicks Care to charge for virtual pediatric visits. And I have a quote here, Dr. Aviva Lowe, speaker from a, pediat a pediatrician who consulted on Kicks Care, is urging the provincial government to maintain access to virtual care. And this is what she said. Pediatricians, and I quote, no Question. longer be able to offer virtual visits for patients because, and she goes on to talk about how it's in, in, unequal for people who don't have uh, family doctor speakers. So my question is, our government, at, at a time when there is a crisis, why are they gutting essential services like OHIP covered uh, virtual care speaker? And the, Eglinton Lawrence, and Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Health. Thank you very much for the question. Um, we just want to take a moment to acknowledge the great work done by all of our doctors across Ontario. And we thank them for all of their efforts. As members may recall, um, with respect to virtual care, during the pandemic, we started to cover virtual care. And before the last election, a three-year physician services agreement was ratified by the Ontario Medical Association and its members. And it was a true milestone because it was the first time in 10 years or so that a, a deal had been reached without an arbitrator. But it also realized another milestone. That agreement made virtual care a permanent feature of our health care system and our health care offering for the first time ever for patients, and we're very proud of that. But under the new framework, things have uh, d uh, been changing, and the way that's compensated has been changing, but that is what the Response. OMA ratified and what the members of the OMA agreed to. Supplementary. 
Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the response from the parliamentary assistant, and, and I would hope that they actually intervene and look at what's happening with virtual care. Lionel, Lionel, a parent in Scarborough Southwest, reached out to our office speaker about his recent experience. After getting sick, the only way his family was able to get medical advice and a prescription was through virtual service. Your speaker, president. our government is allowing for for-profit uh, made from to be made from essential services like health care and fundamentally taking away the rights of Ontarians to publicly funded primary care. And Leah, a little, Leah Little Page, another, uh, another uh, uh, Ontarians who actually talked in the CBC article, talked about her 16-year-old month, 16 months old uh, daughter who had to stay out of the emergency room in the past year four times because of virtual care. So the system that you have come up with for virtual care, it's question. not working. So my question is, Speaker, at a time when pediatric hospitals are overrun, for, especially for infants and babies, and we need to have a virtual care service that actually covers these people like these parents why is this government taking away options that are available that are available to save kids in thank you thank you <laughs> member for Eglinton Lawrence Thank you very much uh, for the question again. Um, as I was saying, under the new virtual care agreement, all medically necessary virtual care services, including patient visits by telephone, will continue to be insured under OHIP. But there are, uh, we're implementing a new pricing structure for virtual care, and that's what we're really talking about here is a pricing issue um, that ensures patients are receiving services through the avenue that best reflects a patient-physician relationship. Patients will continue to have access access to virtual care where clinically appropriate uh, in uh, settings, for example, like rural and remote mental health services. But our government has been clear with virtual care, because this is what we heard from patients, um, it's intended as a complement to in-person care, not a replacement. So we are making a requirement that a physician has to actually meet a patient once within a 24-month period. Response. We don't think that's too much to ask. That provides for better patient care, which is what we want to do in Ontario. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Atacocca. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, my question is for the Minister of uh, uh, Natural Resources and Forestry. We all know the issue of deforestation is a major concern because trees absorb and store carbon dioxide. Restoring degraded forests is a significant avenue for carbon absorption and storage and one of the strategies for addressing global warming. Since 66% of Ontario is forested and almost 90% of those forests are public, this ministry contributes significantly to our role in change helping to protect Ontario in our fight against climate change. Speaker, can the minister explain how our province contributes to sustainable forest development while ensuring the protection of our environment? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Thunder Bay, Atticoke, and he is doing a tremendous job for the people in his riding in Ontario. Yeah, yeah. Right. Speaker, responsible stewardship and sustainable development of Ontario forests are at the heart of what my ministry does. Healthy forests are essential to environmental well-being and provide important recreational and tourism opportunities for residents here at home and for people around the world. The forestry industry in Ontario generated $18 billion in revenue from manufactured goods and services in 2020 and supported more than 148,000 direct and indirect jobs in 2021. Forestry operations are a vital source of good jobs, particularly in rural and northern communities where they may be one of the main sources of employment. Sustainable Growth Ontario's forest sector strategy is our government's 10-year timeline to unlock the full potential of our forest sector. And our plan will continue Ontario's history Spons. of sustainable development and position the province as a world leader in making and selling forest products from renewable, sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for, to the Minister, and thank you for the great work you're doing as Minister of Natural Resources. Here, here. In April of <laughs> in April of 2021, the Ministry created a Forest Sector Strategy Committee comprised of municipal, Indigenous, and industry representatives to continue improving the sector. While many innovative companies in our province utilize the, our forestry products, companies located in rural, remote, and northern communities have challenges that other businesses wouldn't have to face. 
higher costs, access, and difficulties attracting and retaining talent are significant economic development challenges in northern and rural regions. Question. Speaker, Speaker, can the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry address how our government will continue or will support investments in innovation in Ontario's forestry sector going forward? Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. Thanks very much. I want to thank every single employee, too, in the forestry sector in Ontario, because they're doing a great job every, every single day. You know, forest biomass uh, is an incredible opportunity for Ontario, and it includes trees that aren't used in conventional forest products, as well as sawmill byproducts like bark, sawdust, and wood shavings. It can be used in medicines and pharmaceuticals, plastics and polymers, textiles, 3D printing, battery energy storage, and green hydrogen. And it can even be used as a component in jet fuel. Using forest biomass can support both the province's forest management and environmental objectives, helping us to use more mill residues, reduce waste and landfilling, and provide clean energy. As we realize our plan for future uses of forest biomass, these facilities will make important contributions Spons. to the forestry sector and regional economies. Our government is ensuring families, communities, and industry can depend on a healthy and vibrant forest sector. Thank you. Next question, the member for Mishkegawak, James Bay. Merci. Merci. Thank you, Speaker. Once again, Northern was hit with wicked weather, which caused another road closure. Our record so far, three for three. L'hiver va être long. In Hearst this morning, trucks are lined up. Winter will be long. Kilometers long after 12-hour road closure. On Ontario 511, there are no indication of road closures. We have contractors who cannot fulfill their contractual obligations. People are calling my office for the updates. How are we supposed to function up, up north when every snowstorm creates road closure? To the minister, when will your ministry address these issues? Passing my private, mem my, my private member's bill is a good start. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for his question. In our standards for highway clearing across the province, but especially in northern Ontario. <laughs> Speaker, our government recently just announced a new standard for clearing highways in northern Ontario, a new highways, uh, highways 11 and 17 standard called the Ontario Trans-Canada Standard. Speaker, we will see our, our northern highways cleared in 12 hours. That is four hours faster than ever before. And what it does is it represents the massive investments that we have made in clearing our roads in the north, 1,100 pieces of new equipment, changes to our contractor's model, and new weather information st stations. Spons. Mr. Speaker, we've only, we have been working very closely with our contractors to make sure that we meet those standards and continue to improve road, closure, uh, road cleaning in, in northern Ontario. Thank you very much. <laughs> Government House Leader on a point of order. Uh, Mr. Just uh, rise in accordance with Standing Order uh, 59, outline uh, uh, work for uh, next week. So on Monday, December 5th, uh, in the morning, we will be dealing with Bill 51, the Legislative Amendment Act. In the afternoon, we will be on Bill 36, which is the Progress on the Planned to Build Act. On Tuesday, December 6th, in the morning, we will continue with Bill 36. In the afternoon routine, uh, there will be uh, two statements by ministers. The first by Minister Fullerton on the National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women in a statement by uh, Minister Mulroney on the modernization of the French Language Act. Um, in the afternoon on Tuesday, December 6, we will go to Bill 51 again, uh, which is the Legislative uh, Assembly Amendment Act. And in the evening, we will go to uh, private members' uh, bill standing in the name of the member for Kingston and the Island, the, the Think Twice Be Before You Choose Gas Act. Um, on Wednesday, December 7th, uh, bill uh, 39, the Better Municipal Governments Act. In the afternoon, Bill 39, Better Municipal Governments Act. In the evening, we will do uh, the PMB from the member for uh, Mishkigawak, James Bay, Bill 43. Uh, and on Thursday, December 8th, uh, there will be a tribute uh, uh, to a former member of provincial parliament, Mr. David Rottenberg. And in the afternoon uh, is yet to be determined. Thank you, Speaker. 
you very much. Point of order, the member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you so much, Speaker. Uh, today is Romania's National Day, and I would like to invite all members to participate in the flag raising at 12, followed by a reception in room 230. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for Ottawa South has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing concerning the Green Belt. This matter will be debated Tuesday following private members' public business. Next, we have a deferred vote on a motion for closure on the motion for second reading of Bill 46, an act to enact one act and amend various other acts. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell. <laughs> 